Greetings, everyone, and welcome to The Cinema Condition, a podcast devoted to analyzing films and what makes a movie a movie. I am your host, Alejandro Mendoza, a filmmaker, podcaster, and lover of cinema. Today, I am joined by Mariana Rivera. They are a graduate student in ethnic studies and lover of film. And today, they have selected A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Hey, Mariana, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm I'm doing all right too. You know, I'm just uh, it's a nice little relaxing Sunday, right? When we're recording this, and I'm just been doing nothing. That's pretty That's much it. it. Just doing nothing. I'm gonna work out later tonight, but other than that, like, I think I, I think I just been doing nothing all day. <laughs> doing yeah. nothing is doing something. Exactly. I just had that eating a sandwich. So nice, nice, yeah. That's of any importance. But yeah. it's my special recipe. Um I like add spices to it, which I know like might seem overkill, but I think that anything that doesn't have seasonings should. So Yeah. Understandable. Um I uh, it's been a while since we've seen uh, Mariana here and this yeah. is our their first pick for season two so it's gonna be a good one because i had never seen this movie before but of course uh we're really happy to have you back on it's been a minute last time you were on last time we did this i think i was just sequestered in my really tiny apartment like during lockdown right i think so i think our last your last time you were in here was for um for what's it called the tigers are not afraid Mm -hmm. and i think that was your only episode in season one and yeah and that was like around 2020 yeah like 2020 2021 so you were just chilling in here um yeah yeah. and that was when like shit had just hit the fan too yeah wow it's been long though that's been a long time yeah it's been a while so pardon Mm -hmm. me if i'm a little rusty it's okay it's okay uh You've had a lot of stuff going on in your life uh, since then, but this podcast also kind of took a hiatus. So what sh- this this episode, let's be honest, should have been done like last year, <laughs> but it yeah. didn't get done last year because of a lot of stuff going on in my life as well. But exactly. since we've been steadily going through this and we've been steadily been recording these episodes, it was time for Mariana to come on. And I'm excited because, mm-hmm. you know, off air, I still hang out here with Mariana and I'm yeah. excited for them to, uh, get to come back here because it's always a good time when Mariana's on. And I know that Mariana is like part of like a select uh, amount of people where it's like, Oh, I know the movies that they choose are going to (laughs) be interesting to talk about. Like with my friend Leah Burns, uh, whenever she chooses something, I know we're going to have a long discussion about constraint anxiety. And I know that when Mariana chooses something, it's going to be kind of subversive, kind of dealing with objection in a bit. And it's also going to be some horror in there. So I'm like, okay, let's see what's up. I don't think it would be very on brand with of me if I didn't do, yeah. if I didn't choose something that was at least a little subversive. Damn straight. Damn straight. <laughs> hey, you know me well. You know me well. But um, yeah, it's just, um, it's a wonderful day. And I hope everyone is uh, doing well. I want to just thank you all so much for the love on the episodes as of late. It's been a fantastic uh, amount of people that have been watching them. You guys are just, you guys showed that you guys <laughs> missed this podcast. So thank you all. I missed doing it too. And I hope that you all are enjoying it. Of course, I would like to remind you all so much. I would like to remind you all that if you are watching this on YouTube, please make sure that you're subscribing to the channel. You're clicking that notification bell so you don't forget. So you don't forget to watch a video because it's always going to notify you when the video goes live. Also, make sure you leave a like on the video so that way you can go ahead and keep growing and the podcast can reach more eyes. Of course, if you're also listening to this on the audio side of things, please go ahead and drop me a nice little five-star review here so that way it can grow and you're able to, you know, get it to more ears as well. And it just helps out with, you know, Cool stuff like maybe Mubi wants to sponsor this podcast and maybe offer up like a free trial link or something. I don't know. Either way, I get it out of the way early here so that way we don't have to do it in a rush at the end. But please just make sure you're doing those things. And of course, if you want to get this episode early, 
before it's out to the public in months, <laughs> you want to go over to patreon.com slash the nerdy Chicano and you get access to this episode early along with some exclusives like some video essays that I've been making. But other than that, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm ready to, to start this little thing here. I'm ready to get going here. <laughs> I also noticed that um, my thing autocorrected to the wrong name um, in um, the wrong name of the director. So I'm not going to say it like that. It's, uh, it's, it's Anna, not Annie. It's not Anna. It's Anna, not Annie. So, you know, that's cool. It did that to me before I even noticed it, but it's all good. But because we've never talked about the director, Anna Lily Amipur, I'm going to go ahead and introduce her to the people here. So we're going to read a little bit here, y'all. So bear with me. Born in Mar Margate, England, then moved to Miami, Florida at a young age. She has been making films since she was 12 years old. She started her college career at UC Berkeley studying biology, but dropped out after a year. She returned to school to study sculpting and painting at San Francisco State University. She then studied screenwriting at UCLA under the theater, television, and film program at UCLA. Her love for film began when she moved to the United States with her family and feels like she was Americanized through her exposure to American films. I got hooked on them. It's how I assimilated and became American. Through American pop culture and music, Madonna, Michael Jackson, and movies, I was always putting on shows and stuff. My dad got a camcorder when I was 12 and I started making films and imitating commercials. Like I would remake commercials. I wasn't like, I'm going to be a filmmaker. My parents, they never encouraged that. I don't know how they even, even would have. Iranians don't do that. I mean, poor suffers from 30% hearing loss, which she uses to present a lack of dialogue in her films. She made her directorial debut with A, where a Girl Walks Home Alone at Night in 2014, for which she won the Independent Spirit Award for Best First Film. She won the Special Jury Prize at the Venice International Film Festival with her film The Bad Batch in 2016. Her latest film was the Mona Lisa, was Mona Lisa and the Blood Moon in 2021. She has also worked in television directing episodes for Legion, The X-Files, Briar, Briar Patch, and Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. So that is uh, Anna Lily Amirpour and her career. I, I thought it was really interesting to hear that, you know, part about the 30% uh, hearing loss. I, I thought that was, you know, that's pretty cool to kind of use that into your presentation of the film and be like, okay, I'm just going to, have little to no dialogue in my film and have that kind of represent this very like integral part of me. Also, yeah. Yeah. also the whole part of like her parents not really encouraging her to become a filmmaker. It's yeah, pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty, uh, what's it called? Uh, on brand for ethnic households. Uh, that's, that's always, uh, the case and good to see that the, uh, Iranian community, uh, follows suit with that too. <laughs> She's got a very impressive repertoire. Yeah, I mean, hey, the art's got to be made, you know. Art's got to be made whether you like it or not. It's probably the one thing that will survive longer than, you know, s machines. You know, art will always be there. You know, if there's, if there is a world that calls for art, art will always be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, that is my introduction on Anna Lilia Amipur. Now let's go ahead and do this little introduction for uh, for a girl walks home alone at night the film is described to be the first iranian vampire western spaghetti western the film is expanded from a short film of the same name the film was fully funded by an indiegogo campaign that reached fifty six thousand nine hundred and three dollars yeah. Humber Poor shot the film in the united states as it allowed her to not be held down by the restraints of filming in iran the film is heavily inspired by spaghetti westerns and German uh, expressionist films. The film premiered on January 20, 2014 in the next category of the Sundance Film Festival. The film was also adapted into a six-part graphic novel in 2014. I'm actually pretty interested in seeing what that graphic novel looks like. I actually would really be down to 
buy that and, and read it because I really like this movie. But um, I didn't. I didn't want to call the. Um, I know that there was like a, a a comic to that. That was really cool. Yeah. So that's some uh, information there about the film. Uh, of course, uh, you you can tell that it's very uh, influenced by spaghetti westerns and 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 especially German expressionism. I mean, like the the styles there. I mean, it's if. <laughs> If Anna Lilia Report was here right now, I'd say, yeah, I'm pretty sure Nosferatu was one of the biggest films you <laughs> took inspirations here. It's about a freaking vampire. So, um, yeah, you would think. But, um, Mariana, I wanted to ask, uh, why, why, why this movie? Why did you pick this movie? I just, I really liked the, um, the black and gray aesthetics of the movie more than anything. I knew going into it that it was a um vampire film um and just the palette of it really reminded me of Bram Stoker's Dracula in this case it's a woman who is a vampire so I was really I thought that was a really unique take on um vampire movies um like using that same color palette um but this time the uh the villain is uh a woman and I've always really been interested in just like the femme villain and what that does in uh horror movies yeah that's awesome because uh I'll have you know um I right now when we're recording this uh there is a sale over at kinoorber.com they're doing their big spring sale and I liked this movie so much that I decided I, p- I to pick it up on blu-ray so I, I, I liked it so much. I was like, I have to have this in my collection because I need to show it to more people now because, like, I really like this movie. So you picked a really good one because, Thank you. yeah, I, I was like, dude, I, I got to buy it. It's like it's 10 bucks. I, I'm going to pick it up right now for sure. So I ended up buying it. And, yeah, I I really like this one. Um, I was uh, I was very, very uh, drawn to not just the landscape, but also the way that she approaches, like, the femme villain of the vampire. Because, like, usually it's always, like, male vampires. And they're always, like, you know, they're 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 never really um, as vicious as they're shown in this. They're very, like, you know, vampires are usually, like, really sexy. Let's be honest. Yeah. Right? Vampires are sexy. You know, <laughs> they're, they're very sexual creatures. But we'll have more talk about that in the actual conversation but it really drew me in there and like i said um i'll go ahead and tell you all the the story but i i was telling mariana this uh while we were watching it but at a young age i was like really drawn to vampire films and i remember when i watched underworld for the first time i was like i loved it and i was convinced because we have a uh, canine <laughs> piece, that i actually was a vampire because I had canine teeth, so um, I remember I actually dressed up one Halloween as Dracula. And I was like, Ma, I don't need to buy the teeth. Look, I have teeth, like vampire teeth. And, you know, of course, Raul grew up and he realized that um, <laughs> that we all have canine teeth. Some are just not as sharp as, the, as others, right? You know, I, I'd like to think that I have pretty sharp canine teeth. But... um. Yeah, I, I love vampire films, so just thanks for choosing this one. This was a really good one, and um, I'm going to be shooting a Western um, sooner Ooh. rather than later, and I wanted to um, actually now add this to the list of films that I want us to study because this has a really interesting way of like depicting the... Um, not, the, not, the, not, not the landscape of it, but more of the the feeling of the West, of, of what is known yeah. as the West. But, yeah. Can yeah. you tell me about this movie? Yeah, I, I kind of told you about it. Um, it's it's the it's a script that I've been writing for a while now that has gone through like eight drafts now. And yeah. I think I finally got the one that I wanted to do. And mm-hmm. I'm really excited to do it. But it's just been really difficult right now trying to get things going off the ground. And I need to start looking for grants and... Yeah. All that stuff because, you know, $56,903 yeah. ain't that bad. I would be like, to, I'd like to play with that. <laughs> For real. I mean, it's certainly, obviously, it's certainly doable. So, oh, yeah. I'm aiming more for 25000 really. But, um, shit, if I could get 56, you know, I, oh my God, 
everybody in the crew would be would be taken care of with a good rate. You know, yeah. I, we'd be able to get some pretty good lenses to play with because uh, yeah. I know my cinematographer would be dying to get some good lenses for that. So, um, shim, I might actually be able to shoot in Arizona like I like I intend to, and be able to get an Airbnb yeah. and all that stuff. So you know, all all that stuff would be possible. But we have to wait and see how what happens. So. You know, that's I'm really excited just... to see what happens. I know it's going to be something really, really wonderful and amazing. Thank you. Thank you. But, um, yeah, without a further ado, are you ready? Yes. I think I wanted to also, if, you, if you're okay with this, kind of start with, since you gave your own genealogy of, um, like, your approach to, like, vampires and the things oh, yeah. of vampire in movies and, and pop culture, maybe I should give my genealogy. Yes, of, of course. Yeah. Life. Do that before we I go think... into the conversation. Yeah. I think for me, what really like really was um, like many young, you know, late Gen Z kids like Twilight was really what did it for me. Just um, that whole movie series. Um, and like you said, you know, uh, vampires are supposed to be very sexy. And I think that that movie really um, played that part up. I think everybody was really obsessed you know that whole obsession with uh jacob having his uh shirt off all the time and um obviously he was a werewolf in the uh which later i found out by the way there's this like tiktok account i wish i remember the name um they're actually not werewolves they're shapeshifters hmm. i thought but they were wolves i thought they were werewolves no because like they apparently i forget what her name is on tiktok i'll have to look it up later um i don't want to like just because I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. But um, there's this TikTok creator who she just uh, reviews a bunch of, um, or just kind of goes into the lore of Twilight. And they are shapeshifters, not werewolves. Apparently in like book four, I never read the series. I only watched it. And book four, like um, it's revealed that they're not quote unquote, the children of the moon which is supposed yeah. to be like werewolves. werewolves they're just shapeshifters and like those where like children of the moon only turn into werewolves like once a month versus they can like do it on command um yeah but for whatever reason they can only change into into wolves so i thought that was interesting but there's a lot of emphasis on like naked bodies i think i just or uh yeah, just like the body, uh, like the sparkling, that was something new. That's not something that other vampire movies had ever really done. Just like the glass skin that these uh, vampires have. Obviously, there's an emphasis on like the paleness of their skin, but not necessarily like having glowing skin when they're in the sun. Um, and this is obviously um, really uh, emphasized heavily in New Moon when, you know, Edward tries to kill himself because he can't stand the idea of looking at Bella. Um, and I don't know. I think that that movie just is so, is something that really not exploits, but that's what I'm going to use really exploits uh, like young teenagers, usually femme teenagers beginning to explore their sexuality. Right. Cause like, that's such a fan fiction plot. Yeah. Like, these are like thousand, thousand year old vampires, and they're gonna be in high school and they're gonna fall in love with you and they're gonna marry you and you're gonna have like children with them. Yeah. Like, you, you, you did know? know, did you know that uh, Twilight was actually uh, My Chemical Romance fan fiction, right? Stephanie? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I knew was there like, was a connection like, with it. I was like, whoa, like, what? <laughs> I knew there was some sort of connection to my chemical romance, but I didn't know the specifics of it. So now that's just making much more sense. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what that what that was like? Well, that was the, like that's what I heard from like. So obviously, I grew up around Twilight a lot too. I wasn't really heavily into the films as much as I was. I read I read up to um, Eclipse. That's what I read up to. Uh, I never read Breaking Dawn. Um, and I just kind of fell out of it. I was like, eh, it was like, yeah, it's, this wasn't the vampires I was looking for. I was more so in like understanding myself now, like I think I would really was looking for more of the erotic vampire films that <laughs> he wanted to watch. But, um, um, I, I heard from my friends who are like, were really into that stuff. And they were like, yeah, dude, 
like th- that she wrote that because it was mostly like fanfic for from MCR. And I was like, wait, what? Are you serious? It was, <laughs> yeah, and like they never really go into like the specifics about it, but it's like, yeah, like she's like she said, like yeah, it was it was MCR fanfic. I'm like, oh my god, like that just. I mean, I get it. I kind of get yeah. it. Yeah, I think that's something that the, the the that the author and the movies do really well is that they really know their audience. They know that this is like an audience that is coming into their own sexuality for the first time ever. And so they're interfacing with this movie that's about desire, about uh, purity, it's about chastity, et cetera, et cetera, young love, romance. And so, you know, I think it's a really, it's a really interesting movie to interface with when you are coming into your own sexuality for the first time um, in your life, really. And just like, um, as well as the way that it's everything so like I think is very feminized. I think uh, it's a very gendered movie. All the qualities of the characters are, are gendered in a very particular way that are very feminine, um, which is kind of I think <laughs> kind of brings me back to my other uh, another part of my genealogy of like um, vampires. Uh, I. Don't know if you ever heard this urban legend. I don't even know if it's true. I can't tell you who told me. It might have been just a friend. It might have been a cousin of mine. I don't know who. But there is this um like story that there was this like cartel in, in Matamoros, which if listeners aren't aware, uh like I grew up in Matamoros, Tamaripas, Mexico, and Raul grew up in Brownsville, Texas. So like we're pretty much neighbors. Um on either side of the U.S. Mexico border, yeah. and there was this uh, or like a story that I heard from somebody that there was a cartel that was like in that one of the cartels in Mexico in in Matamoros specifically they had these uh, they had these um this belief in like vampirism that they had that they were they believed that they were vampires and apparently they would like you know drink their victims' bloods and stuff like that and do blood rituals. Which is um, obviously a much more masculinized um, quality, a much more masculinized, ma- masculinized depiction of vampires, like in my upbringing. Um, so then that's really interesting how the vampire can be both, ha- can be, ge- be gendered in very particular ways uh, that kind of um, move across a uh, binary, a gender binary. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, so I had never heard of that. I, I did, I remember, and I think it might've been linked to like, what's it called? When I was growing up, it was like, people were saying all the time, like, did you know there's like vampires in Bronzo? I'm like, wait, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> like there's people who drink blood here in this city. And I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, that's like, like, it made it make <laughs> sense. Cause like, to me, vampires were just what I was watching on TV, you know, like, eh, like, you know, biting into the necks and sucking blood like that. So it never really... So I'm probably if I would have connected two and two together, if I had actually, you know, heard about this. And yeah, I was like, that's probably who they were referring to. But um, yeah. yeah, that's really good uh, genealogy. Thank you for uh, sharing that. It's like, you know, well, of course, you know, Twilight's such a big part of like, you know, our, our well, you know, I you're you're late Gen Z. I'm more of like that area in between the millennial and Gen Z where I grew <laughs> up on like. You know, because like I said, my exposure to vampires were, was Underworld. And like Underworld didn't come out yeah. until like the early 2000s. So it's like, whoo. But, um, you know, it's it's vampires still find a way, you know, like they find a way. And, you know, I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there who's like, well, you know, mine was actually warm bodies or, hey, mine was uh, mm-hmm. what's um, um, yeah, oh God, I hope not. But like Dra- Dracula Untold, <laughs> like somebody. Which was that one? Yeah, it was supposed to be the movie that was gonna open the dark universe before the mummy decided to shit that whole universe to the to the. To the shitter. <laughs> yeah, I I don't I I hadn't heard of that movie before. Yeah, Dracula and Told with a Luke Evans as Dracula, and um, it was. Is he that guy from the Hannah Montana movie? I think so. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. that's hilarious. Yeah, that movie along with Tom Cruise's The Mummy was going to be like the opening for this dark universe that was going to include like the invisible man, the wolf man and all these things. And the mummy just did terrible, terrible. Mm-hmm. And it shut down that whole universe. But um, that's a, that's a conversation for another day. Cause that's just, that's, that's crazy how that shit just went down. But, um, 
Yes. So um, without further ado, I think I think now we're ready, right? Yes, we are. All right. Well, this is our conversation on Anna Lily Amipur's A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. So the film is set in uh, Iran, of course, but most of the events are taking place in what is referred to as Bad City. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of uh, different people in Bad City, but our main protagonists seem to be this um, young man whose father is, what's it called, uh, suffering from like an injury that he uses uh, drugs to cope with. And they get the drugs from this uh, pimp and also drug dealer who controls most of the uh, sex workers in Bad City. And most, of course, most of the events happen at night. And at night, they seem to find this mysterious woman who's also a vampire. And she protects and she defends the workers and other women around her who are being harmed by these very vicious and terrible men. And she, what's it called? Uh, well, she does vampire shit and <laughs> buys them, sucks their blood. And throughout the film, we have our biggest topic, which I want to just start off right off the gate. I want to talk about vampires. Because vampires are not just cool, but vampires are the central figure of this movie because that's the whole point of this film. She said, this is the first Iranian vampire spaghetti western. And I wanted to, you know, let's go ahead and go a little back in time. You know, we have Bram Stoker's Dracula and the creation of the vampire there. You know, the vampire is basically this person who, you know, is also kind of like a creature in a way who, you know, has sharp teeth and is able to always, usually, you know, for audio listeners, I'm pointing to my neck here, and, um, you know, they dig their claws, not their claws, like their teeth in here, they suck their blood, and with that, they're able to live long, and they're able to have more life. And, of course, throughout the years, we've seen different movies approach vampires, like, I mean, like, I just brought it up, Underworld, the Twilight films, one of my personal favorite movies of all time, uh, From Dust Till Dawn, is a vampire film as well. Um, but there's also, you know, vampires in, like, literature and stuff, and also the idea of the vampire being a very, you know, sexual creature who, you know, let's be honest, you know, every single time those vampires bite, they never do it like our homegirl in this movie. They don't just go in, like, scary and shit. Nah, those male vampires bite all nice and sexy, and it's like, and usually when, you know, they're getting bit, like, the people look like they're kind of like orgasming at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like it's very sexual. And I'm also remembering an interview with the vampire now because um, mm -hmm. that was an uh, episode we did a, a long time ago on the on the season on the first season of uh, Cinema Condition, which is another one where I thought about you know about vampires also being kind of very sexual creatures. But I want to bring up to at least the confines of our film here. And what the vampire means within a girl walks home and on at night. Yeah. I think that I'll, I think one thing that I want to lead with is the erotic and the the indulgence, the decadence of the vampire. Um, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, go ahead. Yeah, I think that in a lot of like popular movies, like Interview with a Vampire, Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula, um, the uh, what other music, what even Wesley Snipes and Blade. There's oh, yeah. a lot of like um, the the act of like turning somebody into a vampire or consuming their blood is always this erotic act, right? Um, there's like this long drawn out scene of um, you know them the vampire about to bite into the neck right um which like of course the neck itself like areas of the neck are considered i forgot the words is that erogenous erogenous zones yeah. are erogenous zones for uh the human body sites of pleasure um the act of like uh consuming blood you know uh sucking somebody dry for lack of a better word <laughs> <laughs> This is you why know? I bring Mariana on. This is why I bring Mariana on. <laughs> I'm going to suck you drive your blood. <laughs> and 
Actually, that reminds me of like a specific, I think it was Blade Trinity. It might have been the third one. But if you haven't, like I, Blade was is so good. It's like one of my favorite oh, vampire movies. The um, Vampire Rave. Yeah, I, was, I love what? that. That, that scene, vampire, the vampire Rave, exactly. Just like that overindulgence, like, you know, no, the blood's not actually getting consumed there, right? They're just like bathing in the blood. You know, the, the overconsumption, consumption, just indulgence, right? Um, which I think very much uh, speaks to the very notion of like the erotic is like giving into uh, your desire, um, indulging yourself, self indul- self indulgence, indulging with another human, um, so on and so forth. Yeah, and of course, like you said, like you know, the blood is needed to live longer, and you know, you can create new life with the blood as well of a vampire, <laughs> and it's like. Let's be honest, the blood is basically, you know, cum. <laughs> that's what it is. Like, it's ba- that's kind of what it is, right? And it's always been linked to the erotic, but within A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, it's completely not that. You know, the vampire is nowhere near being this erotic creature. The Our, our character, she's actually more scary than she is, um, you know, a, a, a sexual a symbol. She... <laughs> There's scenes. There's a scene where she scares a child, and she st- first of all she steals her sk- skateboard, <laughs> which is pretty funny. <laughs> she scares a child and says, like, if you don't act right and if you behave bad and you hurt people, I am able to kill you. I'm able to suck your blood and I'm able to make sure that you don't exist in this planet anymore. And he sends him off running scared, and it actually kind of gets to the kid because the kid, like, I, if later on in the film, they ask, like, if, if you do, so, if he saw something, he's like, nope, nope, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Like, I'm, I've been a good kid and I'm, I'm okay. Like, I'm not going to say anything else. Like, I'm mm-hmm. just, mm-hmm. I'm laying low. And mm-hmm. she, everybody else tries to, like, view her, like all the other men in the film, especially the pimp, uh, tries to view her as the sexual creature. But what is very interesting with the way that that Anulina Rapport approaches the the um, the vampire in this film is that she also approaches it as the role of a woman in Iranian society, and mm-hmm. in this film she is not a victim. She's mm-hmm. not a victim. She is she is the one in control of her power and her agency in the film, and mm-hmm. adding that extra layer of the vampire, you know, it really opens the doors to creating a, a film that like oh, we finally have, like, the very strong central vampire who's purely villainous and very, you know, vicious instead of just being the symbol of sexuality and and being only there for the attraction of the male gaze. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a very important point. I think for the most part... Um, women and femme people that are turned are either vampires or are turned into vampires in like most um popular culture movies um are their vampirism only goes so far as how it relates to the male vampires that are in their movies for example um bram stoker's dracula where like you know he's got those three wives of his right Mm -hmm. and they live to like serve him and they um are jealous of the I forget what her name is. I should know this, but they're jealous of a uh, Miss Girl that he's that he thinks is like his. Uh, he wants to. He thinks is his um, uh, dead wife reincarnated. Um, mm-hmm. So they all live to serve him and, and uh, pleasure him. Um, and but their vampirism only goes so far as how it relates to his vampirism. How can their vampirism serve his purposes? Um, as well as even in in the Twilight where. Bella Swan is the main character, is a protagonist of that movie. Her vampirism only goes so far as how it relates to Edwards, right? Because she wants to yeah. be a vampire so she can be with Edward with, uh, for the eternity, right? Um, as well as, uh, and this is something that um, the movie doesn't, uh, does differently, is that this uh, uh, vampire who we never actually know the name no. of. The, uh, her name is never mentioned. Only it, we don't know her origin story. We don't know um, whether she was bitten, whether she was born this way. Um, we don't know. So there's no, uh, her vampirism isn't dependent on 
another male character's uh, progression and uh, plot progression. Um, and I, we don't even know if she has to drink blood in order to sustain herself. Um, yeah, yeah they never no... really go into that. Um, they, they, of course, they, they still kind of do stick to the rules, right? Of vampires, right? She never, uh, she's never out in the in the actual like daylight. She, yeah. Uh, we never see about like nobody ever tries to like attack her, so we don't know if the stake and the um, the what's it called the crucifix does anything to her. But um, yeah. At least yeah. it sticks to that rule of the whole daylight thing. Yeah, and I I think you're very right in like the the way that uh, the vampire in this movie isn't sexualized because if I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure every victim she has, um, she's completely covered. She's got that cape on her. Mm -hmm. um, she's wearing pants, so she's completely covered. So she's not sexualized in that manner. Um, which I think is a very interesting subversion of just the trope of the what the femme vampire is supposed to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, Poor just really approaches that really well, where I was like, okay, it's really interesting. It's very different from what you see. And uh, it does bring a different perspective into the way that, you know, the vampire genre has been presented. And, like, yeah. even, and you were, you were bringing up those examples, but, like, even in From Dust Till Dawn, like, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Sama Hayek is a vampire in that film, yeah. but even before that, she has that like very beautiful, sensual, like you know, sexy dance that she does, and and then um, you know, she turns and she turns into a vampire, and she's the first one to go. You know, what's yeah. it called? Um, all the other dudes like live, and the other vampires are are the big bosses, but you know, Sama Hayek goes first, and it's like mostly like, hey, like she was used not just for her like beautiful number that she does, you know, with her dance, but you know, she's also reminded like, oh. Here's our our little shock of like, damn, even the hot chick was the was the vampire. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. I also think the context of like I uh Iran is a really important point to think about. Um I want to think that this movie my interpretation of it is that there was a set in like the early 70s. So this is we we're talking before the time of like the 1979 revolution that happened there. Um and so, you know, women aren't wearing, uh, aren't wearing, aren't uh, forced to wear hijabs. Um, the hijab being uh, written into law as something mandatory for women is um, not, has not yet occurred, right? You know, like you see women like with their hair down, they're uh, wearing clothes that are very, to me, look very 70s. I think also the interior design of a lot of places look very 70s, especially oh, yeah. that like the the first, the the, the the drug dealer, the pimp that got um, fucking murked by her, yeah. you know, that whole looked, that whole, his whole uh, house set up, atrocious as it was, looked very 70s to me. So I think that this is meant to be um, set like right before the uh, introduction of uh, mandatory uh, hijab into the law in, in Iran. Yeah. And of course, when I was reading through like the whole like, oh, they weren't able to film that they weren't going to be able to film this in Iran. And I'm like, yeah, of course, uh, you know, this you first of all, this a lot of this movie would be heavily censored in Iran because of the very, you know, even though she isn't a very sexual creature. Uh, there is a very like sexual nature to the film as well. You know, she does come out naked in some parts of the film, so a lot of that stuff would be censored uh, mm -hmm. in Iran. And you know, it also reminds me of uh, Ali Abbasi's. Uh, and it's completely off topic. It's not a vampire film, but Ali Abbasi's um, Holy Spider that was released last year, and it's finally out on Netflix, y'all. So if you guys do what you want to watch, it's an incredible film that uh, details the history of the of uh, the spider serial killer who was this uh, man in Iran who was uh, murdering sex workers for like for a couple of years and they didn't shoot that in Iran either they actually shot that in Denmark and because of the same thing is like you know this movie was not going to be able to be made in Iran there was no way they would not let us you know detail as much as this history and as much as this heinous act that was you know allowed by Iran to keep happening and they had to shoot that in Denmark. So in this case, it's it's true. Yeah, this movie would not have been able to be made in Iran. This 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 movie would get heavily censored in Iran, and plus the idea of the woman who walks at night and she is the actual protector of her fellow women and 
is able to, you know, overpower these men and be against the gendered norm of being the uh, submissive woman is like, yeah, that <laughs> it wouldn't work in that in that type of society at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I like how she's a very complicated villain as well, because I don't know if she's necessarily like, uh, you know, a like an Avenger per se. Mm. Um, you know, she scared the crap out of that little boy, like you said. And like, he was just a kid. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just chilling on his skateboard, which she stole, right? That she took a skateboard, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, so- took the sta- skateboard, but she did look pretty cool. And she gets her cape and she's just like that. And she's skating. And I was like, oh, you're so fucking badass, dude. Like, I love you. You're so badass. Like, I don't even care that you've been killing pimps and and, and dickheads lately. Like, you're so fucking cool. Yeah. And she also, like, um, she also killed this uh, homeless man as well. Like, we don't know his story, but, like, what the fuck? Like, you know, uh, as we know, like, houseless people are one of, like, the most um, vulnerable members of society. Um yeah. And so, you know, that how could he have defended himself? And then the pimp, that's a very obvious, like, yeah, that guy was a piece of shit. Um yeah. and that was I am sure everybody was just like, Oh yeah, he got what was coming to him. I think it's I think um Arash, I think Arash's father, uh, our other like uh main character, um is I think that one's a little complicated. I'd be interested yeah. to hear what you think, since you know clearly he was uh, a drug user that was very much um, dependent on his um, yeah. uh, drugs, and you know there seemed to be a lot going on there that uh, uh, make his life a little bit complicated. He really missed his like wife um, and his whole um, treatment of the uh, drug dealer and sex worker, who we never get a name for either. Um, it seems to me that the women of this movie, except for the, uh, rich, uh, the rich girl, uh, that was at that, it was at the, uh, I was at the party, uh, she's the only one who seems to have a name, which we could dive into that as well. Uh, but yeah, he was a complicated, uh, figure, you know, and he, like, when he sought out the services of that sex worker, you know, he was, I think he was... I think what he was saying, like, you know, I want you to dance with me, like, in the old days, I think he thought he, in his, like, uh, st- state of mind, he thought that that was his wife. Um, yeah. I actually, now, this will go into this little mini topic we have here about drug addiction, because there's a lot, there's a big part of this film is about drug addiction. I read that, I'll, I thought at first, I'm not even going to lie to you, I thought that was a flashback. Mm. I thought that was his wife. Mm. And... It it, it, it 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 dawned on me. I was like, "Oh wait, no, 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 no! That's a sex worker that he just what's it called? Uh, that he that he sought the service of, and yeah, I don't I don't think he deserved to die. Uh, but it also it was kind of shitty to force this woman to what's it called? Uh, do heroin with you, and it's yeah. like yeah, like that was kind of shitty. And but I think that that's the line where she feels like finally, uh, our character finally realizes that she crossed the line that she can't come back from because she's even told Arash before. It's like, I've done a lot of terrible things. And Arash tells her like, Oh, I, if you've only know half of the things I've done, like I, I'm, I've done terrible things too. And it's mm-hmm. still in a way kind of saying like, she's able to love her. But I think that serves the purpose of, of realizing that our characters like she does kind of have a moral compass. You yeah. know, there is, there is like a little bit of semblance of like, regret for killing the homeless man that I read off of her face and I think that when she kills Arash's father it's like yeah like I I I think I just crossed the line that I shouldn't have crossed yeah I think that you know which is kind of this larger theme that we've kind of been really teasing out since the beginning of this episode that she's a queer villain you know um her moral her ethical uh her whatever moral she might have that lead her to make the decisions that she does in terms of killing, um, avenging, et cetera, et cetera, aren't always clear cut, aren't always rigid. They're not always binary, right? So yeah. she, she's, she's deviant in that manner, which makes her a queer villain. Um, as well as the fact that, you know, all of her victims are men as well. Um, I had another thought, but it just kind of left me just then. So maybe it'll come back. Yeah. But, 
Well, and like I said, like you said, like and he's a dr- he's a drug user, and you know, and, and addiction is such a hard hard topic to depict in film because it's like people never really realize the the struggle that is the disease of addiction and how how badly it plagues people. Like you see it throughout this film, the guy is suffering from terrible withdrawals. Like my God, I looked at him, and I was like, dude, like he's going through it bad. Like please, just somebody find some for him. Like just. Let him get a little bit of a fix because this guy like looks like he's just like on the brink yeah. of just being like losing his fucking mind because he's yeah. getting to him so bad. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something that's also very cleverly depicted in the movie. Just uh, drug addiction, like you said, drug addiction, and like the I think something that the movie does really well is just the um, the um, hierarchy almost that is created around drug use, right? Yeah. Um, where like there's a hierarchy of like like good drugs like bad drugs you know like drugs that are just recreational use like hard drugs um and you know these kinds of uh hierarchies are what uh gets carried into policy um that then criminalize um drug users that use these more hard drugs and put them in situations where um they are uh than doing more drugs, right? Um, like thinking about like the criminalization of heroin. Um, now, uh, the uh, the I think it's we're beginning to come into an era where weed is going to probably be federal. In my opinion, will probably be federally legalized any any one of these couple of years. Uh, and you know, it, weed itself as well, like how uh, oh, there's like a lot of like uh, black and brown uh, people that, you know, sold weed that are currently in prison for the rest of their lives for it. Um, and now you have all these like uh, white business owners that are profiting off of like uh, the legalization of weed. So there's that. Um, and I'm just thinking specifically of the contrast of like the uh, use of heroin by the uh, by the father and the use of um, ecstasy by the uh, that um, rich, uh, I forget what her name is. I can't remember Actually, her name, but she's the one, like, she gave the pill to, to Arash. And yeah, she was, like a, yeah. yeah, like that party drug, you know, which is like, obviously, um, both are classed in their own the specific ways where, you know, heroin users are classed as like, um, either houseless or just, uh, working class um, and, you know, ecstasy being a party pill, having the ability to, to even party, um, et cetera, et cetera. That's all classed as like, you know, um, owning class, et cetera. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking it up because now I'm, I, we keep going, I don't remember her name. Yeah. And it's going to bother well, me. Also, remember in the beginning of the film, uh, when I think the guy was like, um, who, what's it called? Um, the, um, the drug dealer was kind of shaming him for being a, a user and Arash goes, well, who sold him? Who sold him the heroin? He's like, who sold him the drug? Who got him on that? And, mm-hmm. it's, and it's true. It's like we, as a society, tend to put the blame a lot on the user. But who's supplying? Mm-hmm. Who's supplying the poison? Like, who's mm-hmm. supplying these things that, you know, who are um, who are poisoning the people and who are making them, you know, like, uh, addicted to this stuff? It's, like, so easy to just put the blame on Arash's father, like, Oh well, you know he's this man who's just always using drugs, and of course he's gonna suffer from withdrawals. Like it's good for him because he he what's it called? Uh, he was doing them. Who told him to do them? Well, who supplied it to him? You know, mm-hmm. it's a man who who um, who is grieving to the loss of his wife and the mother to his son, and he has no idea how to navigate this loss. And he of course suffered some sort of injury because you can tell his toes kind of fucked up. So. He's like, well, what is he gonna turn to? He's gonna mm-hmm. turn to dr- he's gonna turn to drugs. If nothing else is working in his favor, it's, and it looks like they're not the richest people, so of course they're not gonna have the greatest what's it called um, um, health care or stuff for him to to um, to have. So he's gonna turn to drugs, and that's where our pimp or douchebag here is the one who supplies that to him, and is the one who will has the bigger blame for why Arash's father is addicted. Yeah, I think um, drug use is definitely a complicated uh, health, public health uh, issue. Um, I think it's like, I always want to be very careful um, about not, you know, 
uh, re-stigmatizing drug use, um, which is why I always start with like, you know, harm reduction is like uh, the best policy uh, in terms of like, uh, in terms of um, helping our neighbors. Yeah. You know, not stigmatizing drug use, not stigmatizing certain kinds of um, drugs as like being like bad drugs, um, you know, that there's like a good way of taking drugs and a bad way of taking drugs and there's good drugs and bad drugs. But that always, all that ever does is just um, uh, put people at margins that are uh, vulnerable uh, more so than they already are, as well as like stigmatizing and, and criminalizing the selling of, um, you know, yeah, the selling of drugs. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's just, it's, it's, I thought it was an interesting thing to bring up because it's just, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of, you know, Arash's backbone of his, of his, uh, of his life here with his father. But, Mm -hmm. you know, um, so is, um, you know, our, the first victim is that man and he is a, you know, he's a drug dealer, but I think that what he's getting more, you know, punished for isn't for being a a drug dealer. He's being punished for being a, a pimp. And, you know, he, he what's it called? Um, so he have uh, he what's it called? One of his workers comes and he's he's supposed to what's it called? Um, give her the money. Uh, he doesn't pay her. Uh, he doesn't give her. He's supposed to give her her cut of what she's earned, and she makes him. He makes her give her give him a blowjob, and he doesn't end up giving the money to her. Uh, cause he says she's light, which I didn't understand exactly what she me- what he meant by it's light. I guess he's like even like you're light on the earnings, like. You didn't make enough for me to want to give you enough of a cut, which, you know, is bullshit. Just give her her cut. She she worked for that money. You know, give her a fucking cut. But uh, yeah. but um, yeah. Our first victim is him, and he's you know he's but he like like I said, he's not murdered for being a drug dealer. He's murdered for being bam. He's murdered for being this man who you know what's it called? Took this woman's money and took her agency from her, and you know she what's it called? Um. He gets lured back to his place and he gets he gets murked by the vampire because he thought he was going to get laid. And he thought that, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and stick my finger inside the mouth of this, uh, mm-hmm. what's it called, a vampire who's definitely going to chop it off. I loved, by the way, I love that. I know you, we both loved that. It was like, it was great how he chopped it off and then she oh. feeds, it, feeds it to him. Like, ah, oh, that was so cool. Like, I was like, I, oh. I just always like, I'm kind of specifically... I'm not very squeamish, but I think when it comes to like fingers and stuff like that, I am only because I learned a while back that like um, you can basically like uh, bite off fingers like in the same way that you would bite off a carrot. Yeah, essentially, like it's like it's it's, it's like the same amount of force needed required to bite off a carrot and chop it off is what you what you need to bite off a finger and i'm like oh my god i could easily bite off my finger at any given moment i'm not gonna let the intrusive thoughts win but it's 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 so i get a little squeamish whenever i I see like um fingers being chopped off toes the dogs (laughs) yeah and and that and that that now lead us to like our talk about the subversive here and the objection uh, if there even is any uh, abject, I mean, I would love to hear your side of it. Um, you know, it's just, it's a very subversive film. I mean, the woman, like I said, like we said in the beginning, she walks the streets. She's not a victim. She she is the the villain here. She is the one who is providing the harm and providing the fear into people's into this into the men who are crossing her, and she is um, she's the one who like and there's like parts in the room where like she's got blood just all over her mouth and it's mm-hmm. like coming down on her and it's like she looks like very menacing and mm-hmm. like we said in the beginning it's very different from like you know the vampires who look sexy with the blood in their mouth like yeah. when you look at her she, you're like oh my god like this this girl scares me yeah yeah i think that's definitely something there about the uncanny and abjection as, as well this like um uh a terror that comes that arises when um something that is like like me not quite like me um appears in front of us because like all of these characters are recognizing her as a woman right mm-hmm. but there's something about her that is fucking creepy and it and so 
what this is why I go back to like the fact that this is a queer character this is a queer villain right like mm-hmm. there's she we're queer we are reading her as a woman but there's something about her that's not quite a woman there's something about her that's not quite feminine uh so she lacks uh the qualities that conventionally uh we society has agreed upon are feminine are mm-hmm. um what makes a woman a woman so yeah yeah it like we like you say like and she's more so read as like the a creature you know she she doesn't exist inside of this binary of like what society says is, is a woman she's 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 seen as first she's first seen as a vampire before she is seen as a woman and that's where people fear she they don't fear that she's this woman who's walking the streets and murdering these men they fear that she's this vampire who's walking the streets and attacking these and and, and killing these men Mm-hmm. yeah i think something i wanted to go back to if you don't mind is mm-hmm. um her which i think also makes her more of a queer villain which i think i've been trying to really like i uh, clearly i've been championing this idea that she's a queer villain is um her reasons for um killing the men that she does we read them as as an audience read them as uh her like in certain instances for example with the with the father and with the uh with arash's father and with the, the drug deal of her taking uh, vengeance on uh, t- uh, avenging like um, these men doing horrible things to women, um, she never quite says her reasons. Though she doesn't tell us what her reasons are, so it could just be that she um, doesn't necessarily have a rhyme or reason for doing these things, which is, um, I think, very, I think, very subversive. I think very queer in its own way, where like um, women, in order for them to uh, there's this idea that like women, like in order for them to, uh, you know, uh, commit the crimes that they do, there has to have been something, uh, some sort of, and the specifically a specific kind of gendered violence that occurred for that to happen. Like we don't really like, for example, um, with uh, like some very famous like killers, like such as Ted Bundy, such as Jeffrey Dahmer, such as, uh, you know, uh i don't know john wayne gacy like we all agree that these were just like fucked up men that did fucked up things because they're fucked up right versus like uh the uh depiction of somebody like aileen warnos where okay well she did all these things because like she was a sex worker that was raped by um uh, a lot of men um and I recently watched this uh, documentary on Netflix called Killer Sally. And it was this uh, bodybuilding uh, woman that killed her bodybuilding husband. And like her reason for doing it was because he was abusive and a piece of shit. So there's always, I feel like there's always this um, burden or not burden, but there's this um, expectation that like the reason why women are acting violently is because there is a, uh, gendered reason for it whether that be sexual assault whether that be rape whether that be domestic violence etc cetera, etc cetera. um and then for men it's just like well they just did it because they're fucking violent you know mm-hmm. um so we don't we we do like we read it as you know she's taking vengeance um and she's responding to gendered violence um but she doesn't tell us her reasons why she does these mm-hmm. things um uh, do you think that's Other also why? Do you think that's also why she, they don't they don't give these other women names? It's like once we attach a name to it, we can attach all these other things that society puts upon women. I think it's possible. I think um, I think there's something about take. I think there's something there about um, agency as well. Like you know, having a name, having your name recognized. You know, uh, even being worthy of having a name. Like there's a uh respect of autonomy there's a respect of uh agency in that sense and i think that that's something that she subverts right you know she's got she's clearly got agency right um and like even when arash uh you know shows up on our front door and is like well, we're getting out of here she, i don't think she, she's strong enough to to have been like fuck you you know uh, either killed him or just told him to get the fuck out uh and not gone with him so I think that there, that was a very deliberate choice of hers. So I think there's something very 
interesting happening there uh, in terms of like uh, playing with like agency and what it's supposed to mean and the way we understand it by not giving her a name. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And, um, and as you like, and throughout this film, she kind of is like this, you know, kind of a protector of agency because she's comes to the aid of mostly these sex workers. And also I, I, I finally, I think it now clicked in my head why she also doesn't have a name. She is based because this film is a spaghetti Western she is this vampire with no name, just like in the Fistful of Do- the, the the Dollars trilogy from uh, Sergio Leone, where Clint Eastwood plays the man with no name. And, you know, Sergio mm-hmm. Leone plays this man who is protecting... Well, first of all, let's go ahead and get something out of the way. Sergio Leone copied Yojimbo from Akira Kurosawa and completely stole that plot. So, you know, if anything, we should be saying... That this vampire is actually a uh, what's it called representation of the symbol of Yojimbo from that film. So Yojimbo is this man who you know basically is 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 uh, entrusted by the people of his village to protect them, and he protects them against incoming invaders. And in A Fistful of Dollars, Clint Eastwood's character does the same thing, but he's not given a name. You know, he's just he's called the man with no name, and he protects them and. In this film, that's kind of what she is, but like in a way, she's also not a protector because you know she's kind of also looking for her own interests too. She's kind of always like she she's kind of hesitant to mm-hmm. um to what's it called to pursue this uh this um partnership of some form with Arash. You know, mm-hmm. she I I I love that scene when they're in her room and she's like kind of grabbing onto his neck as if like she's thinking about wanting to yeah. bite him mm-hmm. but she's like no like i don't want to and she just lays her head into his into his chest and it's like yeah like this this woman this the vampire is also kind of like thinking about her interests and like you know mm-hmm. this is somebody who i don't think that i can cross the line and and, and kill i think that this is a person mm-hmm. who i actually kind of uh like her company and i actually like being around like I haven't seen yeah. them do anything that would cause me to want to harm them. Like, you know, her what's it called? He's just the son of this man who is doing drugs and would uh, what's it called? Um, eventually, you know, force this sex worker to do drugs with him. But, you know, I'm not gonna really blame him for what his father is doing. Mm-hmm. Kind of catch my drift, right? Yeah, and I don't think she knows. I don't. I don't think she knows that um, he's her. He's her son. You know, he has that realization at the end that she killed his dad. She's the one who killed his dad because of, you know, she told him I've done terrible things. And then he finds the cat, which the fucking cat, like, yes. oh my God. Like, he's literally everywhere. And I just, I especially, I think I love. Oh, that final movie. shot. The final <laughs> shot. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I just, it's just a rush. The cat in the middle, yes. and then the vampire, and they're just there, and like in this really badass car. It's yeah. like also love a uh, Chekhov's uh, car here. Uh, we introduced the car yeah. in the beginning. We got to have the car back in the end. <laughs> yeah, but um, oh my that, God. that final that shot's legendary. Cat. Legendary. As well as the cat, but you know the car was the the cat was at the beginning, the, the, and the cat, cat was also yeah. Yeah, Chekhov's cat too. I just, I think, like, my favorite part of it was, like, um, you know, cats are cats. You can't tell them what to do, like, really. Um, they're going to do what they want to do when they want to do it. So I'm like, I don't know how they managed to get this cat to just be so chill throughout the whole um, movie while they were filming. And then I just, you can definitely tell, like, in that, fi- especially in that final scene, where the cat is, like, looking directly at the camera. And, like, you know, there's, like, you can tell that there's, like, you know, obviously, obviously there's, like, people behind the camera filming yeah. and shit like that and the cat's just like what the fuck's going on because like up? he's just like looking straight at the camera like there's so many scenes in that inside that car and love i was like the, that's i thought that was hilarious love and how really, the cat's the one who breaks the fourth wall <laughs> yeah yeah and i thought i don't know it made it that much less like um uh it made it that much like less intense for me only yeah. because like you know he's driving out of the city with um uh, the girl and the vampire and he already has that knowledge that she killed his dad. And then when he got out of the car, I thought he was going to do something. I thought he was going to, like, he was, like, there to just, like, kind of come up with a plan or something. But then he just comes, like, right back in, just kind of sits there and then looks at her. And he looks, like, you know, he looks almost happy. Um, I can't really quite tell what. I. 
it was very difficult for me to get a read on what and what um what was going through his mind like uh a lot must have been going through his mind, but I wanted to know what your thoughts were on like Arash's realization that she killed his father and she's the one that killed his father. Um, and his like decision to just still continue on with this plan. And then that moment, like where he steps outside of the car as they've driven out of the city, but then he comes back in, he looks like he's going to continue down this uh, journey with her. Well, so before that even happened, Arash had given him the drugs and told him, like, here you go. You want it? Here you go. But you're not going to be in this house anymore. He goes, like, you, you, it looked like his dad had kind of pissed him off already mm-hmm. to the point where he was like, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm getting out of here. And you can, you can, you want to stay here? Like, you got to get out of here. Um, I don't know. And I couldn't really get a proper read of him either. But I kind of thought it was more of like, okay, she said that she had done bad things. And mm-hmm. I've done bad things either, bad things mm-hmm. too. And mm-hmm. of course, it's my father. Yeah. But if I were to judge her, then I have to judge myself too. And yeah. And it's kind yeah. of a way of like saying like, maybe the slate is clean now. Like maybe we can both help each other to kind of rid ourselves of all these things that we're doing that are making us, you know, uh, bad people in our eyes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think... Yeah, okay. Because he's probably carrying my, you know, he's probably blaming himself, right? You know, if I hadn't turned my father off, I didn't kick him out, like, you know, he could still be alive right now. And so this realization of like her killing, she told him, I've done bad things, right? She told him uh, point bless you tell him what things. But she's a she's creepy as shit. So like, you know, <laughs> you know, I feel like I could only imagine what she's done if I meet this person. And um, I think that in a way, I think he is a character that's kind of dependent on her, which I think really um, switches that whole um, trope of like women in vampire movies being dependent on the vampire, the male vampire. Like, you know, he wouldn't have uh, gotten his car back or and he wouldn't have... um, been able to continue selling drugs and making money off of that if she hadn't killed the guy because he you know how like he came in and uh was at the guy's gate and was like all right i'm here for my car back and then when he went inside she's coming outside he goes inside um and she also that's another thing too like he must have known at that point what she's done or like Mm -hmm. um i don't know he must have like realized put two and two together because like he sees all the jewels she's stolen and she walked out of the, the guy's, the pimp's house, the drug dealer's house with blood all over her mouth. And he goes inside, he sees his body. Um, he takes the drugs, he takes the buddy. So, um, and um, now that he doesn't also have his like father to worry about in that, in a way, which is awful, right? Cause he's dead for awful reasons. Cause he's dead. Um, you know, he couldn't have done that without her, like, without her killing him, right? Um, yeah. So I think it's a very interesting where, like, this character, like, a male character is dependent on... On a woman, a yeah. Character. Yeah. In a vampire movie. Usually it's the other way around. Usually it's, like, the vampire is a man, and the woman's dependent. The woman who is, is or isn't turned into a vampire uh, is dependent on the man. In this case, it's switched around. Yeah. And... um I wanted to get in here with this, with at least with this last one. I, we did talk a little a, a bit about the, the sex work part of this film. I don't know if you wanted to add a little more. I wanted to kind of get into like the analysis more of the Western part of this film, which I thought was really interesting. But uh, it's also interesting the part, the, the depiction of sex work here. I don't know if you wanted to bring in some stuff about that. Um, I think maybe I was really, in, I think I'd be really interested to hear like what, I guess, Cause I don't have a, like a lot of experience with like, um, Western movies are not my, they're not my bag. So I haven't okay. seen a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, I know that they're gendered obviously in very particular ways. And like the Hollywood Westerns that I'm familiar with, like are about like, um, you know, conquest domination and are pretty anti-indigenous, um, as well. And they are about like a certain form of extraction. Um, so I wanted to like, I I think bef- I think that would be helpful for me to like get that context of like what your thoughts are about like 
um this being a western movie and just like contempt uh or not contemporary but like um classic hollywood western movies yeah so uh i mean part kind of approaches the western differently here um it isn't the straight up John Wayne, cowboy versus the Indians, and, you know, he's going to be the conquesting figure who's going to conquer the West, and he's going to relocate these Indians out because they're causing trouble. Like, yeah, that's not, that's not what this is. Um, it's more of an approach to it as, uh, as close to what Sergio Leone does in A Fistful of Dollars, but if we would like to go first into analyzing what the aura of the West is. We have our morally ambiguous ambiguous character, who is our vampire, who mm-hmm. plays the role of our cowboy here. Uh, we also have the um, the western type of look because like it's kind of deserty. It's got like you know these like very old timey cars because it is pretty like it is the it is the seventies like and also the uh, town looks very like uh, very like looks like a western town from like those films you know if you if you know what i'm trying to say like it looks like if they didn't tell me that this was shot in the united states i would have been like that kind of looks like west texas or like that looks like ne- like arizona or nevada yeah um because of the oil drills <laughs> yeah the oil drills which also kind of adds a different layer to this whole movie yeah about they, like, there's like a lot of um i mean <laughs> There's a lot of uh, shots of our, like uh, um, oil drills, and yeah. I think that I was I, I know that probably I, I you know just um, U.S. intervention um, yeah in uh, places like Iran Afghanistan aren't like necessarily something that I have a lot of knowledge about, but you know like the obvious thing with that the first thing that came to my mind was just like uh, you know U.S. intervention in Iran that uh, caused like a lot of like um social and political socioeconomic instability in the country um and just like uh uh the uh, extraction of oil um from iran uh because of like u.s military intervention yeah that's the person that came to my mind yeah S- same here um and i guess that's also kind of like the role of conquest within the western yeah. you're like hey here's this outer force who's like controlling our land and Basically, you know, we we are more calling back to the Spaghetti Western here because it literally kind of is an homage to A Fistful of Dollars. And the vampire plays the role of the protector, whether she likes it or not, because what's it called? She isn't really uh, hired by the people of her of, of her of Bad City. She's more so uh, welcomed by them like everybody else, like nobody else who is not getting killed has a problem with her doing these things like the. The, what's it called? Uh, the the uh, the sex workers are kind of just like, yeah, you were watching us, okay, like okay, um, and then of course you have this part about the western that really always uh, interests me, and it is betrayal. The uh, betrayal is a big part of the western, and in here it is where she betrays Arash, whether she knows or she knows it or not, by killing his father, and. I think that the way that Amipur kind of approaches the Western is very subversive as well because it's not a direct look into the way that the Western plays in the United States. It's a very different because, first of all, you know, you have a, uh, a female uh, vampire at the forefront of it. You know, it's not, a, it's not a male, like, macho cowboy like John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or, you know, um, it's, it's not a John Ford type of approach to the Western. And... She does that by uh, by having this female vampire there, and it's very interesting because, like like I said, she's not really hired to protect them. She doesn't necessarily even want to protect them. She's just kind of like, oh, I'm gonna just kill them because they're obviously doing bad things. Whether we we as whether that's the uh, assumption that the that the what's it called the um, audience makes. But she's kind of welcomed, and it's kind of like, well, thanks. You know, you did that, and you helped me, so now I don't have to deal with this asshole. But um, that's kind of the way that she approaches the Western in this film, and it makes for really a uh, makes for really interesting way of like navigating that because it's um, I don't know the West. The Westerns are so complex sometimes. Like you have your very like 
cookie cutter, you know, westerns like, you know, those John Wayne films, but then you also have stuff like um No Country for Old Men, um Hell or High Water. Mm-hmm. Um and even something that I recommended to you, uh Baku Hell. Baku Hell, mm-hmm. which is like it's a Brazilian film but it's a western because it is this group of people from this town called Baku Hell who are are uh, being invaded by these uh by US backed um um operatives who are trying to come and murder the people of Bakuhel and the people of Bakuhel just stick there and they defend their land. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's interesting the way that she kind of approaches it. You know, it's very different. It's not it's not a it's not the the American West, but it's in a way it's creating an Iranian West. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, I just, uh, I'm so glad you brought up, like, Hell or High Water, by the way. I know this is a total aside, but that was such a good fucking movie. I yeah. recently watched it back in, I think, August or September. Yeah. I was, like, on the edge of my seat the entire time. I was like, oh, my God, the tension. Like, yep. I was stressed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a movie that we're, we're heavily studying for the film that we're going to shoot. That's, oh, that's awesome. one of the big ones that we're shooting because we're a lot of the film is going to concentrate more on the thrill of the hunt rather than like the actual, you know, the West West. But it's more of like, you know, vengeance and somebody, you know, waiting and trying to find that person. But yeah, it's this film just reminds you a lot about, you know, those films. And it's just because uh, it's it's a way of moving the needle and pushing the envelope, mm-hmm. but also showing like you know, the aura of the American West isn't only mutually exclusive to the United States. Mm -hmm. It can be found in Brazil, it can Mm -hmm. be found in Iran, and it can be found anywhere else. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Uh, You know, I I know that we're kind of getting close to the end here, but I wanted to give you some room to bring up some other stuff. Maybe talk a little bit about the kitty cat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i feel like we really covered everything you know i think the only thing oh um, i mean you mentioned like bringing up um sex work and i think this is the the like the last thing that i have about that is just like these uh i think that the show does a really good job of um recognizing sex work as work um like the labor part of um sex work there's always this and then obviously like with a movie that's so concerned about like um uh sexuality and um like the rigid binaries where sexuality like lives you know um you know i think that there's this uh there's uh this um and since we talked about morality too as well there's like this and when it comes to sex work there's always this like moral panic about the nature of um sex workers uh work right you know that being like sexual services with the I think that there was a uh scene where like we see a street sex worker just kind of like you know uh work in the street um not uh as well as um uh uh that um I think I I looked up her name <laughs> we're still but... stuck on her name yeah well and like and like also like and I love that you brought that up because it's like showing how like different of it is like labor because like what's it called, Arash's father employs her, and what's it called, uh, seeks her services, but not to have sex with her. He mm-hmm. just has her there because he thinks it's her wife, and it's like, oh, like let's just do drugs together. Whereas, yeah. like, these other men that we saw, like, the pimp was just, like, seeking her services just to, you know, what's it called, have sex with her. And yeah. it just shows, like, how different it is, and it's, like, a really good uh, depiction of it. Um, yeah. Her name's Ati. Ati, Ati, okay. And, um, yeah, I mean, what I was just going to say is just, like, um, you know, nobody, like, asks, nobody, like, questions the uh, morality of, like, uh, a fucking um, tech bros line of work, right? Even though there's a lot of, like, uh, there's a lot of um, things there about, like, the, that are obviously morally uh, questionable, right? Uh, The extraction of data, the extraction of, um, yeah, the extraction of data and how that's uh, not properly used. Um, but everybody always, like, questioned. There's always a moral panic around um, sex workers. So I think that the, the movie does a good uh, a good job of, like, um, not going into those really gross uh, depictions of, like, sex workers being these, like, 
degraded women who have no agency um, and who are just like so uh, degraded and they, they need to be saved, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily, I don't necessarily think that she was saved by our, uh, our uh, vampire, our favorite vampire, um, vampire per yeah. se. Definitely top five. Yeah. Yeah. And even yeah. if she was saved by her, uh, you know, she, uh, she's like, we established already, she's a queer villain. So there's some like, you know, not, uh, there's nothing like, uh, there's no like male savior, which is usually what yeah. the case is for like, um, uh, the depiction of like saving sex workers in movies, like my least favorite movie of all time, Pretty Woman, you know, you know, where like a man saves a sex worker from her line of work. And yeah, I don't even, <laughs> Yeah, and, and like I said, like, yeah, it's, she's more so welcomed as, like, the protector. She's more of a protector. She's not saving them because it's, like, I'm just here to make sure that, like, you know, they realize that they're the ones in the wrong. Like, they're the ones who are taking away your agency, and they're not giving you your cut of your money that you deserve. And they, uh, yeah, they, she brought, she really, uh, she really depicted that really well where I was like, okay, like, that's really interesting. Like, I've, I've never seen like that in... Of course, I brought up Ali Abbasi's Holy Spider. I mean, in that film, like, just... I, there's no way that you can't depict the terrors of sex work when you're discussing this man who, for years, was murdering them and and was being... What's it called? Um, Was being... um, What's the word I'm trying to say? Was... um, With the government was trying to say, like, oh... You know, let's publicly put this guy on a trial and show everybody this man's reasonings as saying, like, I'm here from Allah to save them because they're impure. And it's like, yeah, it's like a very different approach. Whereas in this film, it's kind of like, you know, this is real. This is work. And, you know, there are people who are just like in any job, you can be put into danger. You know, mm-hmm. at my job, at your job, we can be put in danger just like they can be put in danger. Um, mm-hmm. The vampire is more so there as a way to, like, Make sure that it's safe. They're not there to save people, but more so being like, hey, I'm here to make sure that you get to do your job uh, as freely as anybody else gets to do their job. Everybody has a right to safe working conditions and safe working environments. Damn straight. Damn straight. (laughs) Yep. I shouldn't have to. (laughs) Well, you know, that was my my fault. That (laughs) That was my fault where I hit myself on the head with the light kit. But, you know, that's. Oh yeah. no! <laughs> yeah, that wasn't that wasn't fun. But um, I think that wraps up our conversation. I think we had yeah. a damn great conversation, like always. Yeah, that was that was so much fun. I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you yeah. for inviting me again to do this. I really appreciate mm-hmm. it. Well, you did get bumped up one more slot in the season, and we're not hey. going to say what movie you're doing next. But you are coming back later in the season to talk about yes. another film. So I'm really excited to do that one as well. But um, you're not out just yet. Of course, Mariana is a great guest here, and we love having Mariana around. But Mariana needs to choose a film that they will be coming back to season three of The Cinema Condition to discuss. And Mariana, do you have one in mind? Yes, Crimes of the Future. (laughs) (laughs) We are going to talk about... I had a feeling, though, that I was going to say that. Like, honestly, BFFR. You knew I was going to say that. Long live the new flesh. Surgery <laughs> is the new sex. <laughs> David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future will be Mariana's pick for season three. And then we'll see what else. Oh, my God. Oh, God, you know me so well. I can't <laughs> wait to talk about that movie. Aren't cause... you glad I didn't say Barbarian, though? Oh, God, I'm so glad you didn't say Barbarian. <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy you didn't say Barbarian, but yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm really interested to see what we, what our conversation will look like for um Crimes of the Future. I I love Cronenberg. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. He is a director who always pushes the envelope, and he's somebody who, to me, is you know I don't think he I don't think in the back of his mind he's like I want to make queer films. But he yeah. kind of makes queer films. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, they're so trans. I love it. Exactly. Like, they're so trans. But, like, I don't think David Cronenberg gets on set and he's like, all right, y'all, are you ready to make a trans film here? 
and he's like no <laughs> like yeah. no he doesn't but yeah i mean yeah. body horror is always going to be trans like mm-hmm. yeah and you know it's part of the formula yeah uh and i'm just like i haven't seen a cronenberg film in a, in a while either last time i think i mean i saw the brood a while back and then i saw the fly as well and like you know yeah i need you to watch so, crash. really can for another cronenberg film I need you to watch Crash um, because my <laughs> God is Crash great. And also kind of talks about like the sexual desires of disabled people too, which is something that mm-hmm. never, ever gets brought And as a fellow disabled person, it's something that doesn't get brought up here on uh, in film at all. And Crash mm-hmm. does that. It's just oh, so fucking awesome. But um, yeah, that concludes our conversation here. And I want to thank you so much for joining us. You don't you don't have anything to plug? I know that um you you don't really like you know plug social media all that much, but at least maybe nope. Instagram or something. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I I will. I, I don't want to like um put this out just yet because it's still in the works. But there, I want to say that in the near future there will be something to plug. So when I have that, when I have like a something that's like more concrete to give you, then I'll then I'll. Oh yeah, totally. I'm totally gonna use your platform to awesome. to to promote that. <laughs> and you're free to do it. Thank For now, you. just go and check out the past episode with Mariana. Listen to this one. Go back and listen to our episode on Tigers Are Not Afraid because we did a great episode. I love that Woo-hoo! episode. Yeah. And. For now, y'all, just thank you all so much for joining us. I want to thank you all so much for sticking along with this. And I love this film, and I I bought it on Blu-ray, so that shows you all how much I love it. Um, I I kind of I have this little thing where I do like, oh, I'm gonna buy these movies because I'm on Blu-ray because like before I even watch them because like they're for podcasts, so who cares? Like it's secretly me wanting to grow my collection even more. But uh, <laughs> but I'm also just like. Raul, you just want to have them in your collection. So, uh, <laughs> you know, this time I waited until I watched the film, until I decided if I wanted to buy it. And this one deserved it to buy it because it's damn good. And um, yeah, but thank you all so much. And of course, you can keep up to date with me on all things social media as Dinari Chicano. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Letterbox, Serialized, and on TikTok. I'm under all those and as well as Twitch. Check out what I do with the Nerdcore by checking us out at thenerdcore.com. YouTube and Twitch is under the same thing as well, the Nerdcore. And, of course, like I said, I'm not telling you all what we're doing next, but we, we will have a familiar face on the next episode of the Cinema Condition. But in the meantime, to my wonderful cinephiles and renowned scholars, celebrate the love of cinema today, tomorrow, and every day after. Catch you all in the next one, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.